Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, Chilliwack. How are you? Everybody good? All right, so uh, my name is Paul. Uh, like um, John said, I work at a church in Vancouver called Broadway. It's in East Vancouver. And I've been there for about three and a half years. I've uh, been in the lower mainland about 11 years. And I was in Kamloops before that. And that's where I met uh, Josh, who's the worship pastor here. We, was, uh, we were... We were good friends, and he was uh, in my youth group when I was a youth pastor back then, and um, that's how I got to know him, and now he's here. And so uh, it's real an, a real honor to be here to uh, share the word with you. Um, so I don't really know you, you don't really know me, so I'll start, okay? I'll tell you about me. So uh, I'm, um, you don't need to know how old, how old I am. I have two kids, been married about uh, almost 20 years. Uh, we became parents through adoption, so we have a beautiful um, African-American daughter named Annalise, who was born in Hawaii, and she is uh, beautiful, energetic, full of life, but uh, shy whenever she comes outside the house, very, very shy and, and quiet, and loves to read and loves to, uh, loves to help. She's very helpful, and um, we also have a uh, one-and-a-half-year-old daughter, named Winnie, who came into our home just a few months ago, and she's from China. She's from uh, Yunnan province in China, and she is uh, she has not stopped moving since she came into our house. She is just a bundle of energy. Uh, she's, uh, she's very brave and very takes lots of risks, more, more than mom and dad would like her to, but uh, we are humbled um, to have those girls in our home because uh, God has put our family together. We are thankful and we, uh, we have, I don't know if any of you have had an experience with adoption, being adopted or having adoption as part of your family story, but it really helps me see the kingdom of God and see God's love in a, in a unique way, not in a different way, not in a better or worse way, but just different. And so I'm so thankful that uh, that's part of my story. And so it's a really important part of who we are as, uh, as parents and as, uh, as Christians. So at Broadway Church, like I said, I've been there for about three and a half years. I take care of a bunch of different things there, missions, prayer ministries, benevolence, uh, things like that. So I do a bunch of different things. And, um, but tonight, it's my honor to be here. Okay, so I told you a little bit about me. Now you need to tell me a little bit about you. So how many of you are from this church? Well, lots, okay. Uh, how many of you still live with your parents? Okay, thanks for being honest. Uh, how many of you are students? Okay, how many of you have jobs? Okay, okay. All right, that kind of gives me an idea of who we're, what we're dealing with here and, and who's, who's here. So I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're here. So just so you know how I operate, uh, I don't really feel like I'm smart enough to give you one of those aha moments tonight outside of God being here and kind of massaging it into your mind or into your heart. I believe that God's word is given to us so that all of us can understand it. And so hopefully tonight, what I'm going to read through and what I'm going to bring up is going to intersect your life rather than me coming as some guy who's a pastor from some church giving you some sort of wisdom that you didn't already know. I think what it, probably what I'm going to do is remind you of something that you already know because that's God's word is, is there. And if... Uh, if you've been here more than once or twice, you probably have a copy of God's Word, and you've probably read through it or read into it a little bit. And so I'm just praying that what I share tonight intersects where your life is at right now, and maybe God has something for you uh, out of that. So let's pray, and then we'll look into uh, what, I, what God's Word has to say. So tonight, God, I just thank you for the privilege of being here at, uh, at Central, and I uh, thank you for the chance to just say that you're awesome one more time because uh, I've seen you be awesome in my life and I've seen you be awesome in my marriage and in my family. I've seen you be awesome in our church and uh, it's just a great honor to tell people again how awesome you are. And so may your word pierce our hearts. May your word um, intersect our lives tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So uh, I wanted to share a little bit about uh, getting ready for Christmas. And so the title of my uh, message tonight is The Kingdom of More. The Kingdom of More. Okay? 
So I think in the next couple of weeks, you're probably going to hear somebody say these words. You're going to hear somebody say, I just want Christmas to be different this year. I just want Christmas to be different this year. Now, when people are saying this, um, usually what they want, what they're trying or what they're meaning when they say that is they're saying they don't want to miss it. Like they don't want Christmas just to pass them by and, and for them to miss, miss what's going on. The other thing they're probably saying is that they want to celebrate the true meaning of Christmas when they say that. So tonight, I want us to think about how do we recalibrate our souls to experience Christmas in a different way, in an authentic way. Now, I want to just begin with a little pop quiz uh, to start. You know, um, I'm going to give you a fr some phrases, and I want you to shout out what, uh, what is associated with the phrase that I'm going to shout out, and just to see if you, you can figure it out. So, uh, when I say the phrase, takes a licking but keeps on ticking, what is, that's for what? Watch, time is watch, yeah, okay. How about melts in your mouth, not in your hands? M&Ms. They're great! Frosted flakes, corn flakes is a close, <laughs> is the sad cousin of the frosted flakes. How about Home of the Whopper? Burger King. You can do it, we can help. Home Depot. Home Hardware. <laughs> Again, the sad cousin of Home Depot. <laughs> How about give me a break, give me a break, break me off a piece of that? Yeah. A cat bar, okay. So, you know, people work around the clock to come up with stuff like this. People earn master's degrees in expensive colleges to come up with those things. They, pe people have branded their products very effectively. They've embedded those phrases within us. You know, takes a licking but keeps on ticking was uh, written and thought up long before you or I was born. It's, it's one of those phrases that has stuck in our memory and attached to a brand and stunk, and, and it's gone through the test of time. Some of these slogans are decades old but we still remember the product. Now. If I say the word Christmas, some of the things that come to your mind might be trees or gifts or toys or, you know, food, turkey or family or holiday, you know. And hopefully, you know, we're all in a church, right? How many of us, it takes a while of when we're thinking of Christmas, we're usually thinking of the things we need to do or the people we're going to visit or the places we need to go or the gifts we need to buy before we think about the fact that this is actually Jesus' birthday. It's, it's not always the thing that's associated with when we think of the word Christmas. It's not the first thing that comes to mind. We have a branding problem here. We are going to need to break free of what advertising executives want for us if we want to discover what God wants for us this Christmas. Now, it's entirely possible that if you want to have a Christmas this year, that you've always longed for, that you're going to have to, in essence, rebel. You're going to have to rebel against what uh, the Christmas that the world has corrupted uh, Christmas to be and, not, and to turn towards the Christmas that, that Jesus intended for us. Now, to rebel sounds like one of those, it's either one of those cheesy words or one of those negative words that we don't want to use anymore because, uh, I don't know, it's just kind of one of those, sounds a little bit uh, anti or against but really, to rebel is actually in the DNA of being a child of God. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. And if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's not only a part of our DNA as the people of God, but it's also part of the DNA of the Christmas story. Listen to this path, passage. This is from Matthew 2. It's a little bit longer, but I'm going to read the whole thing. You'll know the story. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east. We've come to worship him. When King Herod was, heard this, he was disturbed and all, the, all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet had written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. 
that Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After that, they had heard the king. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where Jesus was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened, then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled the, what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. So just like the, the Magi, or the wise men, we call them, rebelled against Herod and returned to their country by another route, this is the type of anti- and countercultural thing we're going to need to do if we want to reclaim Christmas and God's design for it. You know, I think so many times we just kind of endure Christmas rather than celebrate it. Tonight I really want to help you understand what it means to celebrate Christmas. I want to tell you a story. Uh, I think it was for my, I think it was my 10th anniversary, my wife and I went to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. So we, we got on the plane, and we, we flew down there, and we got there, it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so we just we dropped our bags in the hotel room, and we just threw on our board shorts and our swimsuits, and we're like, let's go, let's go to the beach, right? And I had, uh, I had just gotten glasses, new, new glasses, and, uh, and so we went to the beach. And so, you know, we're, 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 at, we're at the edge of the, edge of the water, and, and we're, uh, you know, the, the waves are coming in, and, and uh, you know, you're kind of doing that thing where you kind of go up to the wave and jump over it when it hits you, you know, that type of thing. And uh, about up to my knees, maybe halfway between my knees and my waist in the water, and having a lot of having a lot of fun because you know this is not what you get you know when you when you live in Vancouver or, or in Surrey you don't get to see the waves like that so we were enjoying it it was warm it was nice and um, uh, my wife's like I'm gonna go in and sit on the on the towel for a bit I'm like sure no problem so she goes in sits on the on the sand on the towel and uh, I'm still at on the water or in the water and I turn around um, just to look just to look to see what she's doing and I stopped. Uh, I, I just kind of, I don't know if I zoned out for a few seconds anyway, but the next thing I know, I see my wife going like this. And I turn around just in time to see this wave hit me at about head, head height and knock me over. And it knocked me over and picked me up and pushed me into the, into the shore. And uh, I mean, it wasn't like a, a tidal wave or anything. It wasn't uh, anything like that. It was just one of those waves that I wasn't watching, and it knocked me and totally knocked me out. The first thing, I stood up, and I went like this, and I realized my glasses were gone. The, the water had sucked them off, and I, so then I'm running back in the water, looking, 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 and I didn't find them. Lost the pair of glasses. The problem that I had was I didn't see the water coming because I was facing the wrong direction, right? If I'd seen the water, if I'd seen the wave come towards me, I would have moved out of the way, or I would have been prepared for it, at least by taking my glasses off and putting them in my pocket, or putting my hands over my face, but I was pointed in the wrong direction. When it comes to Christmas, many of us are pointed in the wrong direction. We're not faced in the right direction. We're, we're faced usually towards three things, one of three things, or maybe more than one of these three things, but usually traditions. Our traditions are pretty important to us at Christmas time, you know? Grandma's turkey, or Uncle Bob's weird stories, or our stockings, or, you know, the food that we have at Christmas, or the, the games that we play, you know. My, my wife's family, they, they love their traditions. They have the same breakfast every Christmas morning. They have the same Christmas dinner, which is not untypical, but, but the same breakfast. And, and then they always go outside and play hockey, and, and it's always kind of the same things, and it's the, you know, ma, uh, Grandma makes uh, uh, pajamas for everybody, and, and we all wear pajamas, at, you know, in front of the tree. It's our traditions, you know. Sometimes at Christmas time, we're too focused on our traditions. 
The other thing that we're often focused on at Christmas time is our hurts. Invariably, and I can't believe it working in, uh, in the church, how many times you see people that have had loss or problems, serious problems that happen at Christmas time. Invariably, people end up with significant hurts that have either happened at Christmas time or get amplified because of the fact that it's Christmas time. Lost parents or family members, car accidents, breakups, or people losing their jobs. Sometimes, or it just seems that Christmas time is, is always the time that amplifies that or, uh, or it ends up being the time that, hap that has happened. Just this past week, I've, uh, I've been at the bedside of two people who have passed away. One who I was, I was holding her hand and, and encouraging her to, to, to pray to accept Jesus in her life, and she didn't. And another gentleman that I, I prayed with and, and prayed with, and he did accept Jesus into his heart, and he passed away a few, late, a few hours later. Right around Christmas time, I know both of those families well, and I know that invariably next Christmas, there will be that pain will, will rise up again. So our traditions and our hurt, often that's the way, that's the direction we're pointed in at Christmas time. The third thing, of course, is ourself. We're often pointed towards ourself. People are lonely without friendships or significant others at Christmas time. They feel like they're lesser than because they don't feel like they have anyone to spend Christmas with. They don't have anybody to put, buy a gift for in that way. The first question I'd like to ask you tonight, what direction are you pointed this Christmas? Navigating the Christmas season so that you are left with meaning or substance and the presence of God is a choice. It's a proactive choice we make and follow through on. Luke chapter 2, we discover that Caesar Augustus is tightening his grip on the Roman Empire, uh, which stretched all the way from England all the way to India, and we acquired a, a tax or a tally of everyone in every place. From that point onward, Rome is the backdrop of the New Testament story and the message. From, there, from then onward, Christianity runs against the grain of the empire. It runs against Caesar's plans. Caesar claimed to be divine. He claimed to be God. Even the coins and the documents from the Roman Empire verify this as an undeniable fact. Did you know that archaeologists have unearthed coins that refer to the Caesars in the following way? Like written right on their money. Salvation is found in no other than Caesar Augustus. Another coin that was found that says, There is no other name given to men whereby they can be saved other than Caesar. And of course some that say simply Caesar is Lord. Octavian Augustus called himself the son of God. And the poet of that day, Virgil, who died just years before Jesus was born, said in his writings that Augustus Caesar believed he could mediate between heaven and earth and bring peace and goodwill toward men. Do you hear kind of some of these words that maybe you've heard before? Because they're actually in scripture. The Christians took the already well-known ascriptions, to us, the things that were ascribed to Caesar, and they gave them to Jesus. They knew that when a person chose to follow the resurrected Jesus, it placed them on a collision course with Rome. Peter's first sermon in Acts chapter 4 was basically treason. In one sentence of one sermon, he takes two claims that Caesar had branded into the people as truth and transfers them to Jesus. He says in verse 12, Salvation is found, no, not in Caesar, but in no one else. And then he says, For there is no other name under heaven, given to men by which we must be saved. The writers of the New Testament were basically putting, painting a gigantic target on themselves when they lived out and went through that. When the angels said that Jesus would bring peace on earth and goodwill towards men in Luke 2, 14, the writers were rebelling. When Luke pens Mary's words in uh, in chapter 1, verse 52, he brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those in humble estate. They were basically, again, just painting circles and targets on themselves. You see, if we're going to point ourselves in the direction of Jesus this Christmas. You need to remember this, this phrase. Saying yes to Jesus is going to require you saying no to some other things. Saying yes to Jesus is going to require you saying no to some other things. 
Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I don't know if you guys celebrate, uh, or if you actively celebrate Advent. Advent is, uh, is basically a period in the church calendar uh, from years ago, hundreds of years ago, that uh, generally in the modern church we don't really celebrate because we, we feel like we've broken free of that liturgical or structured um, thing. But I love Advent. I've, my wife and I and, our, and now our children have celebrated Advent specifically over the last seven, eight years. And the reason I do it is just because I love the structure. I love taking this Christmas season that gets away from me because I have banquets and I have uh, dramas and I have uh, cookies to hand out to my neighbors and I have you know, eggnog to make and I have all these things to do, but it brings a structure into my, into my Christmas time that always seems to get so wildly out of control. The word Advent means coming, and the season of Advent that we celebrate is the anticipation of Jesus coming. In the church calendar, it takes up the four Sundays before Christmas Day. This Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent, November 29th. Each one focuses on a different characteristic of God, usually peace, joy, love, and hope. Do you see how the world has counterfeited the story of Jesus by making it all about the anticipation and coming of a man who brings toys and presents instead of a man who brings peace, joy, and love, and hope. We have a, in our house our, our homemade advent calendar. We fill it full of candy and also full of activities each day that we do with our, our, our daughter. And this year it'll be the first time we do it with both of them. The way we make it special as a family is we make it an important tradition for us. So uh, my daughter isn't really the one who's going to come up and tell you what she wants for Christmas. She's pretty shy, but she sure as heck wants to know when the advent calendar is going up, and she knows it's getting close. My eight-year-old has had that tradition now kind of instilled in her. It also means that it's so special that we pause each day in December and take time to remember that we have a special guest coming on December 25th. We bought an advent, we bought an advent ca uh, candle we don't light one every Sunday. That's generally what they do in churches. We have one long candle that uh, we found, and it's just awesome because it just has one, the numbers 1 through 25 on it, and we just kind of burn one day's worth of candle every day. And while we're doing that, my wife and I and our daughter, we sit and we read uh, our, an Advent story. We read something about Christmas, and we pray together, and we just pause and say thanks. And it, for me, it's it's just a real reset on the whole, on my whole life to, to do that for the lead up to Christmas. It really has helped me understand how special, and it's helped me celebrate the birthday of Jesus better. Scripture also says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, uh, the armor of God passage that we have read so many times, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may, uh, so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities and the powers of this dark world. It's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We're all vulnerable to the beckoning, competing calls of loyalty that Christmas brings. I don't have this all figured out, but I'm committed to fight against the tension I feel in my heart. You know, like, I'm, I'm the biggest um, Apple fanboy that you could, you could find. Like, I, I love all the products, except for the watch. I just really haven't found that that's going to be useful for me. But I love all the other products. I'm the biggest fanboy. But you know what I realize is that those things can really have a hold on me. They really can have a hold on me. I can, I can get all starry-eyed about these products when they come out, you know? I have to be committed to fight against it. I have to, in my mind, say, that's not right. My life as a Christ follower should not be that way. John 16, says, I've told you these things so that, you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. 
I have overcome the world. Is it worth asking ourselves another question here? What's the one thing that you sense is competing for your devotion this Christmas season? What's the one thing that's saying to you, only I can satisfy? And in other words, here's the second question I want you to ask yourself tonight. Who's whispering in your ear? Who's whispering in your ear? Why would we expect that during a holiday that's so full of materialism that has sidetracked the true meaning of this season, that we as the church would be immune to those attacks? The gospel and the good news that you carry with you can be summed up in these two words. Take heart. Expect to struggle. Take heart that God is with you. Realize that he will bring you peace through it. If you kind of feel this tension this Christmas, and if I could pray something into you as a group of people, was that you would feel the tension, the dissatisfaction, maybe even the ugliness of materialism this Christmas. Because like I said before, saying yes to Jesus will require you to say no to some other things. Whatever it is, it's an idol claiming that there is happiness in nothing other. In the first century, of course, that idol was the kingdom of Rome. And in this 21st century, it's the kingdom of more, just more. Saying yes to Jesus will require you to say no to some other things. This is going to cause a struggle. A Globe and Mail article from uh, 2014 said that 50% of the people who uh, are using credit cards to buy their Christmas gifts in 2014 were paying off, still paying off 2013's credit card bills. There's got to be a better way to celebrate Jesus' birthday than just buying gifts, just buying stuff. Jesus was the one who was poor, the one who was outcast, the one who championed the needs of the poor, the one who claimed to exclusively be able to provide humankind with satisfaction and meaning. Who's whispering in your ear? Let me tell you another story. Um, this happened actually when when uh, Josh was just a kid in my youth group, I remember we were in Kamloops and uh, we were going to go to Abbotsford, uh, which back then was like, man, that's, that's a huge drive coming all the way down to Abbotsford. That was like a big deal for us coming down to the coast. And so uh, we we're going to make this drive with a couple of other the youth from the youth group because there was um, something going on at, at the Bible school that my denomination is part of and we wanted to be part, we wanted to go down for the weekend. So uh, I, uh, my dad and mom were living in Countless at that time, so I borrowed their vehicle, and they had a, they had a, uh, a diesel Volkswagen, and I'm like, those things are, you got one of those? All right, come on. Um, my, my dad loves, my dad still has had them for all my life, he's had a, a diesel Volkswagen. Uh, anyway, I borrowed their vehicle because uh, I knew they were gracious enough to lend it to me, but uh, it was because it's diesel, and that man, those things are cheap on gas, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna get down to the coast and back, and it's gonna be way cheaper than taking my own car. Uh, so so I did that. So we drove down to the coast, had a great weekend. Uh, we went saw the school, and uh, and this will tell you how long how long it was ago. We went to a Grizzlies game. Actually, went to two Grizzlies games, I think. And uh, and uh, then we're we're coming back um, up the the uh, the freeway and pull off in Abbotsford, and it's like, okay, better top up the gas tank. So top up the gas tank, and then we just, we just had her. We didn't stop. We didn't, uh, I think everyone fell asleep, and so I'm just driving and driving and driving. So I get to, uh, I get to about 30 kilometers outside of Camus, and then it's, it's kind, of, kind of a windy downhill drive, and, and I get to maybe about 15 kilometers from Camus, and I'm like, man, the car's just running a little bit rough. Man, what's going on? Like, and my, my dad's car was a little bit old, but I'm like, I don't, I don't, this doesn't feel right. So once I got into town and I had to knock my speed down a bit, it started to run a little bit rougher, and I'm like, oh, no, there's, something's not right here. And then I get to drop off the, to the first home where I'm dropping off one of the kids, and then it dawns on me. When I gassed that car up in Abbotsford, I put real gas in it and not diesel gas or not diesel. And I'm like, oh no, this is, and of course it's not my vehicle to make it worse, this is my dad's vehicle, right? So I, I don't know what to do, but I, by this time now, it's like, it's shake, like the vehicle's shaking, right? And it's shaking, and, 
And so I, I have to keep it really hot. So I'm just revving it really hot. Like I got it in second gear and going like 80 kilometers an hour just to keep it really, really warm thinking, I, like I'm not a mechanic. I have no idea what I'm doing, obviously. And, and I just like, I got to keep it warm. That's the only thing I'm like, I got to keep this engine warm. So I, I, I gear it way down and I just rev it, rev it, rev it, rev it, rev it as we're going. And I get it back to my dad. I'm like, dad, this is stupid. I did, I'm sorry. And, and my dad, my dad's pretty easy going. He's like, oh, okay, well, let's go. you head home now and, and we'll figure it out in the morning. So went back to his house in the morning. We brought it to the gas station, put diesel in it, thankfully. And it seemed to, it ran a little bit rough for that whole tank of gas. But then after that, it seemed to be okay. I felt really lucky, but it was, a, it was bad. I almost wrecked the car. And I've heard afterwards that people have actually wrecked their vehicles doing exactly what I did. I put the wrong gas in the tank. So long story to uh, lead to my third question tonight. What's driving you this Christmas? What is the fuel in your tank? Is it desire for others to like you so much that you go into debt to buy them a gift? Is it the, the desire to have that gift? Are you often disappointed at the quality of gifts people buy you? <laughs> Is it pride? Do you want to give the best and have the best and be viewed as the best? In Central America, there's a road called El Camino de la Muerta, which means the road to death. This road, which stretches from La Paz, Bolivia, to the Amazon basin, has been deemed the most dangerous road in the world. Up to 300 people a year die traveling it. It has huge drop-offs. It has mud, rain, and mudslides. It, it has virtually impassable washouts, and it is extremely narrow and has no guardrails. But people continue to think that they are the special ones and they can manage it. Chasing it is a road to death. Whatever it is in your mind cannot satisfy. Isaiah 55.2 says, Why spend money on what is not bread? and your labor on what does not satisfy. Let me say it to you again. Saying yes to Jesus will require you to say no to some other things. Now, I'm not telling you that your giving is too lavish and that you need to tone it down a little. I'm not saying that you have a heart like the Grinch and that your two sizes is too small and that you need to pick it up a little. But here's just a few practical things I think you can do over the next few weeks to kind of get this idea of rebelling against what Christmas is being shoved down our throat to, to believe. And if you can get this now, you might really enjoy these next four weeks. And it may be really more than just good food and gifts and family. It might actually really be a spiritual awakening in your life. Four things. If you want to rebel against the Christmas of this world, you need to give differently. You need to give differently. Don't give your money to a store. Give your time or your money to a charitable organization. Volunteer somewhere. Email me and I'll find you a volunteer opportunity in my city to serve the poor. Give of your time. Give of your, of your finances to somebody who doesn't have and isn't blessed as you are. Number two, like we talked before, you need to resist this hyper-consumerism of our age. You need to resist it. You need to be committed to being in a struggle against consumerism. Okay? I, uh, I've, I've started really trying to um, get rid of the extra clothes that I have in my closet because I realize that I... I it, over the course of a few years, you can really accumulate a lot of stuff that you don't need. And so I've been, I've been trying intentionally every week to kind of pick out, okay, you know what, I haven't worn that in a long time. Take out one thing. Put it in, a, put it in the, the, the bag, and then once the bag gets full, we donate it to Salvation Army. And just trying to, to get rid of, the, of all of the attachments and the stuff that I feel like kind of weigh me down. We don't need a lot to live. And when we kind of compare, we, we can kind of carve and get rid of some of that stuff, it helps remind you that your hope is actually in Jesus. It's not in your things. 
um, looking down at that Seattle hat down there. I have, I, I'm a bit of a hat collector. Like, I like a lot of, I like flat build hats. And uh, uh, that's something that I need to get rid of too. The problem is, is that my head is so freaking huge, nobody would buy my hat. Well, I'd need my hats anyway, right? But, but even like, because they're like these nice things and I, you know, I see them and I like them and I buy them and then it's like, I don't need that. I need to resist it. So give differently. Resist the hyper-consumerism of our age. Three, don't settle for superficial. Listen to the carols you're going to sing over the next few weeks. Listen to those words. I, I tell you, like, I've been a worship leader, and it can be a really frustrating time of the year to lead worship because people, oh, come, let... I, I don't want to do that thing where I sing and you laugh. It's, it's like... It's like, it's just so blah. Like, people get into kind of this um, kind of autopilot when they sing Christmas carols. Realize you're singing these celebratory songs to Jesus, and there are great lyrics in there. But not only that, like, get deeper, like, when you're in that worship context, but invite someone over or connect with someone this Christmas and get deeper with them. Maybe somebody that you have a, a superficial relationship or a one-level relationship with. Maybe it's somebody at school that, that uh, you've done a project with or someone at, uh, in, in, your, in your friend group that, that you know at one level. Try to go a little bit deeper, you know, with that person. Get involved in their lives. So give differently. Resist hyper-consumerism. Don't settle for superficial. Number four, celebrate the Lordship of Christ and look to him. For satisfaction. Every time you pray over the next two weeks, or over the next four weeks, sorry, begin by thanking God for all the blessings that you have in your life. Now, if you do this, you're truly rebelling against um, what the world tells us Christmas is supposed to be, be like. And rebellion has consequences, right? You rebel against your parents' rules, generally consequences. You rebel against the laws of the land, there are consequences. Rebelling against the laws of society, there are going to be consequences. But it's part of our DNA as Christians. It's part of our faith. There's nothing people hate more than a hypocrite. And there's nothing less that any of us want to be. That's why if we let our faith say one thing, but our actions do another at Christmas. We're a Christmas hypocrite. If we, if we raise our hands to Jesus when we sing joy to the world, but we don't have his joy in our heart, we're a Christmas hypocrite. Let me close with one last scripture. This is the most important scripture for the first century Jewish Christians. It's the Shema. It's quoted in Mark chapter 12, and that's where I'm going to read it. From. Jesus says the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. These would be Jesus' two core values, the core values of his life. Maybe this Christmas we could start by filtering what we're going to do over the next four weeks. We could filter it through these two core values, and we could make them our core values. Loving the Lord with all of our heart and mind and strength, and loving our neighbor as yourself. Let's pray. God, I am so thankful for your word that gives us life and gives us hope that is uh, deeper than just a new gift or a, a new phone or a new laptop or it's deeper than a, a new piece of clothing. Father, your, your hope gives us eternal life. You said that you came to give us life to the full. I just pray for this group of people that over this Christmas season, these next four weeks as we uh, dive headlong into Christmas, 
that you would help us to celebrate your birthday with abandon and with with joy that we would we would really have a celebration in our heart as we go through these weeks celebrating your arrival anticipating your coming forgive us god when we are so sucked in by what we see um, in the commercials on tv or 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 in a magazine or on a, a ad banner on a website and we we are lured in by what those things we think those things offer us they they try and make us feel better about us or they want to try and make us feel better about ourselves or make us love uh, love their product god our devotion needs to be you we need to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and then we need to love others just as we we love ourselves we need to care for the poor and the orphan and the and the widow and we we need we need that our hearts need to be broken Lord, this there are are homeless and 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 hurting people in chilliwack just like there are in my city god i pray that these christ followers would go out and find them and would love them and they would love the person who lives next door to them and they would they would care for their 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 loved ones and their families and 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 the neighbor and the poor and and all of the people that are in within their sphere of influence. Let's pray blessing on this group of people as they go to school, as they work in their jobs, that you would cause them to be a light and that um, that picture of a fireside collective, that they, each one of them would be small flames that light up the, the, the context that you've called them into. And by doing so, they become a bright light for your kingdom and for your name uh, in Chilliwack. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.